Amen, amen. You know, every time uh, we sing a song like that, I'm just always imagining, man, we are joining in with the legions, the chorus of angels uh, surrounding God's throne, singing at the same time. And so it's not just us in this room, man. It is all of heaven proclaiming how good our God is. Isn't that, isn't that encouraging? It's encouraging to me. Hey, hope you're feeling good on this uh, blustery but wonderful Sunday morning. And we're starting a new series today uh, called Samuel. But before we get there, I would like to start out by telling you a, a, a very true uh, personal story from, from somewhat long ago. So I've always known since I was honestly 10, 11 or so years old that I uh, was called into the ministry, kind of whatever that means. And that's a big statement, but I just knew that somewhere in my future, I was supposed to do full-time ministry. And I fought against that even for a little bit. I thought pastors were weird. I'm sure we are. But uh, at that point, I was convinced they were. So I didn't really want to be that, but I've always just known. And so I uh, wound up graduating high school, decided to go to a Christian college to get my pastoral degree. And so I've told you all the story before, whether you've been here or not, about my first summer after college, which is I worked outside in the heat putting up metal sheds, and it was the worst thing ever. Matter of fact, if you have a wayward teenager, let them do that for a summer and say, yeah, hell's hotter than that. They'll probably get saved. So anyway, it's a terrible summer, terrible summer job, one of the hardest things I've ever done physically. And so then the next summer, I was convinced I was not doing that. And so... Uh, you know, we'd been part of Cornerstone since I was, in, you know, a teenager or so. And we grew up here and got to see this church grow from a, a basically a small group meeting in a, a gymnastic center to what it is today. And we were along for that journey. And so I've known Artie, Pastor Artie, for a long time since I was in my early teens. He used to hang out at his house with his daughters and family. And so I knew him. And so the, the, my sophomore summer, I came and asked him, I would like to intern at the church because I had decided that, man, it is really time for me to start my ministry career. This is, this is the moment. This is the beginning. And so he said yes. And I can still remember quite vividly uh, waking up that first morning, putting on a nice shirt because I was going to work in the ministry, put my nice pants on and even put my good shoes on because, man, today was the day that my ministry in Jesus was going to start. And so I got to the church. We were over at the Willington campus at the time and pulled up and went to his office. All right, Pastor Artie, what is it that you need my help with today? I have arrived. I didn't quite say it like that, but I was feeling it, man. That was what was on the inside. I'm sure it was much more meek than that. And so the first job that our pastor asked me to do was build about 10 of these. So my first day in ministry included a bucket, because they used to have buckets, concrete, a shovel, and this post. And so I had to go in my nice shirt, in my nice pants, and my no longer nice shoes, and my very first week, actually, of ministry included going out to, actually, it was Alan, who's still our head of security, going to his house and helping him make this very one. This thing, I would like y'all to examine the craftsmanship here. This thing weighs about 130 pounds, I think. I don't know. It's very heavy. That's just an odd estimate. And it has still lasted. The bucket has gone, but my work has shown true. Isn't that awesome? Congratulations, me. Woo-woo. Any idiot can mix concrete. So anyway, let me tell you, it was not what I had expected at all for ministry. Matter of fact, I remember thinking, one, I think he was pulling a power trip over me because Artie has known me for a long time, and I think this is exactly what he's trying to do. He's trying to put me in my place. That's what he's doing. The second thought I thought was I could do this hard work for much more money because you don't get paid nothing as a church intern, by the way, and so I'm out here mixing concrete in the heat in my good clothes. So my calling started nothing like how I'd expected it to, but isn't that like life, though? Like we have these grand ideas and whether it's with a calling that God has given you or just something in life, so many things don't turn out how we expect them to, do we? Marriage, a good example, right? Because y'all just living on love and sunshine, aren't you? Aren't you, you newly married folks, you not yet married folks, all you engaged folks, man. Oh my goodness, when I find that girl, she's going to cook for me every night. It is 2020. That is not true anymore. Your grandmama maybe did that, but uh, that ain't the truth. Actually, my wife goes, I love you, honey. You're great. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. Your job isn't like you thought it would. You walk in thinking that you were about to teach somebody something, right? And strangely enough, nobody really cares what you know. Isn't that funny? 
But things all the time don't turn out the way we think they should, and that is especially true when it comes to following God. And the, one of the main things I want you to know, and we, I say this all the time because it's true, and you need to know that because you hear stories like mine, and when I say, man, I've known what I was supposed to do back when I was a, a, basically a kid, and maybe that's, not, maybe that's unique to me, but God does have a purpose for you. If you're here today, it's not by accident. If you're breathing today, it's not by accident. God does have something specific, or actually I would say many specific things, because we have an arrival mindset. God isn't like retirement. He may call you to something now, and then he may call you to something very different later. But here's the problem. A lot of times we miss the now, and we never even get to later because we're so locked into now. And part of that reason is because when God calls us to something, oftentimes it isn't calling us to glamour or to glory or what I would actually say is sexy ministry or sexy living or sexy calling. And I use that term, obviously, understanding the connotations, but we want to do things that make us look good and feel good, don't we? And so when it comes to God, too, I want to do ministry that makes me look good or feel good, right? That's why a lot of y'all don't want to volunteer with them babies. Me neither, because it doesn't make you look good or feel good because babies are terrible. Everybody knows that. (laughs) Unless it's your own and you think they're cute, but they're still not cute and they're terrible. But anyway... You think that on the first, but by the second one, you're like, these are terrible. These are terrible. Anyway, stay on point. But the problem is, we want to do that feel-good ministry, that feel-good calling. And again, calling may not be going into ministry, but if you are a believer, you do have a ministry. You do have a mission. And oftentimes, God is calling us to start with something like this. Now, obviously not physically like this, but something that is unpopular, uncomfortable, difficult, and hard. Not what we were expecting. So the point today that I really want to get across to us is is how to be faithful in difficult circumstances. Faithfulness in difficult circumstances. So for the next several weeks, we're going to look at the life of uh, Samuel. Samuel was a prophet in the Old Testament. He actually has two books named after him. And to kind of get us up to speed on Samuel's life, his entire uh, beginning story was actually in difficult circumstances. So we'll start with his mom. His mom was, was barren. She had a, a doting husband who loved her. Actually, he even asked this question, which is really funny because marriage has always been difficult. But she was quite upset about the fact that she couldn't have children. He literally asked her, am I not enough? And obviously the answer was no. Um, so he was not enough. And so she would plead, and every time she would go to the temple, she would plead and beg and cry and weep before the Lord to give her a child. And finally, she actually makes a promise. Ever ever made a promise to God, like in that pinch of the moment, like, Lord, don't let this officer give me a ticket, and I will insert blank. You know, I'll go to the mission field, right? Just don't give me a ticket today. Or college students, you you do some hard praying before them exams, don't you? At least I did. I was super close to Jesus right before test. Anyway, so... But it's funny how we can make promises. But she did. She made a promise. And she promised that the Lord would grant her a child that she would give him back or give him or her back to the Lord. She specifically prayed for a son. And the Lord did bless her finally with a son. And can you imagine? Put yourself in this position, mamas. And so the Bible says she weaned him. And when it was time, probably when he was between, say, three and five, she took him to the temple and gave him over to the Lord to be raised in God's house. Left him. Talking about holding true to a promise. Now God did go on to bless her with many more children. But Samuel, the one that we're specifically talking about today, did uh, grow up in the temple. And his mentor was a priest called Eli. So in this time in Israel's history, this was right before uh, kings like King Saul and King David. Very fa- famous kings that we all would know about. Samuel actually picked those kings. But in this time... Uh, prophets would often act as judges and God would speak through them and they would go about judging the people of God and telling them what they should do, not do, make rules uh, in a sense like a form of government in a sense. But the purpose was is that God was the leader of his people and he spoke through his prophets. And so Samuel was the last in that line of prophets that specifically kind of ruled over the people in place of kings. And so we see Samuel, he's being raised by Eli. Now Eli is also an interesting character because he was the prophet of the Lord and he was supposed to be this upset standing righteous man and in some ways he was but in many ways he was not and more than anything he allowed his sons who were also priests take advantage of God's people by stealing and taking food from the offering and sleeping with the women and so they were not very righteous or upstanding at all and even though Eli was not doing that he allowed it to happen and so what we find in 1 Samuel chapter 2 
is that God actually lays judgment on Eli's family. And that sounds harsh, um, but then don't be in leadership, I guess, because leaders will be judged more accordingly, more harshly. Scripture actually tells us that. And so God lays judgment on Eli that if he does not correct his course and his son's course, that these are the things that would happen. And so we find out he does not. And so that's where our story picks up in chapter 3. So we're going to start reading in Samuel chapter 3. So Samuel's lying down one night. Very famous passage, but let's, let's, let's read it with fresh eyes this morning. First Samuel chapter 3. Starting in verse 2, one day Eli, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his usual place before the, lamp, uh, before the lamp of God had gone out. Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was located. So Samuel's inside the temple where he kind of worked and was an intern, basically, if you will. Number four, then the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back down. Go back and lie down. So he went and laid down. Once again, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up and and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. I didn't call you, my son. He replied, go back and lie down. Sam was probably thinking, he's losing it. He's absolutely losing it. I'm working for a lunatic. Anyway, I'm sure he didn't think that, but I probably would have. Now Samuel, verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So once again, For the third time, you know what's really great about God taking a pause here? Y'all probably hate it when I do that. Like, just finish the verse. Well, hang on. What's so great is how consistently God actually does pursue us. Because wouldn't it have been a terrible, sad story if God only called Samuel once? And I do want you to know that if you were thinking, well, this is an awesome story, but I don't think God speaks to me this way. Let me tell you, he, he does speak, and it is different, and it's not only different for people, different people, but it's also different throughout the aspect of our lives, and it may not be audible, but some people do occasionally, but what I can promise you is that God is consistent. The problem is we're also very consistently ignoring him, but that's another thing. We'll get there. For the third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up, went to Eli, and you can tell he's probably a teenager, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. Verse 9, then he told Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. So the first thing you need to know about about faithfulness in difficult circumstances is this. Faithfulness begins with hearing from God. Faithfulness begins with hearing from God. From God. Now, to illustrate this, do you can you remember, probably most of us can, can you remember your mom when she turned on the mom voice? Like you know what I'm talking about? Like that you're almost in trouble voice, but you're not quite in trouble, but like the mom voice. And you know what's super interesting as a child, whether you were in a mall of a thousand people or in a party with a bunch of people, a bunch of other different mamas, a bunch of other different kids, your mama call your name in that voice. Guess who who, who you heard? You heard mama, right? And you didn't pay attention to other people's mamas. Their voice didn't mean anything to you, but you recognized your mother. And likewise, that was in correction. But many of you, even if your moms aren't even here with us today, and maybe you're even a grandmother now, you can still remember the sweet, comforting words of your mother, can't you? Like there's power in the voice of our mother, of our parents. Like I got a dad voice. I call my Son, you know, that's my thing. My dad used to call me boy. I don't know. And I was a boy. I just knew. Straighten up at that point. But there's always that voice. You recognize the voice of your parents, of your mothers, of your fathers. Well, likewise, we can learn to recognize the voice of God. Here's the problem, though. There are a lot of voices vying for our attention in the world, right? Matter of fact, here are a few of them. There's a voice of just your own desires, what you feel, what you want to do, your own dreams, your own passions. And not necessarily those are bad things, but oftentimes they're not the God thing. And so we have the voice of just our own self-desire echoing in our ears. But then there's also the voice of culture speaking to us from every single angle, telling you how you should think, how you should live, how you should vote, how you should treat people, how you should feel about this. Voices, 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 voices everywhere, aren't they? 
voice of culture. They can be the voice of your peer group, voice of your friends, voice of your spouse. You can have the voice of your mistakes. Have you ever noticed how every time you try to go into a new relationship, what starts to speak? The voice of your past starts speaking or the voice of your past failures starts speaking. Isn't that interesting how that's also a voice? There are so many voices and not like the I'm hearing voices craziness. That's another thing. But there are voices vying for your attention and approval, trying to dictate your direction every single day. And the problem is it can drown out. And we can not recognize, even just like Samuel, Samuel did not recognize that God was speaking to him at first because it is a trained, a trained habit. It's a trained skill to learn to hear the voice of God. Like I'm, like I'm serious, it's a trained skill. So here are a few tips on how to listen for the voice of God. Because some of you might be thinking, I don't think that God speaks to me. I'm telling you, he does. He does, he does, he does, he does, he does. If you are a believer, if you are, if you are joined with Christ, then he does speak to you. You are his child. But just like Samuel, you have to learn how to listen. And so here's, the, here's, here's just a few tips. Number one, solitude. Solitude, this is so big. Solitude. Where was Samuel? Samuel was lying in his bed alone. See, the problem is we're not ever hardly alone. You're thinking, well, I'm alone all the time. Not with that. Not with that thing, are we? Matter of fact, guilty as charged too, by the way. But matter of fact, what is generally, group confession, the first thing that you do when you're waking up? Besides hitting the snooze button, the other thing. Checking that Facebook, checking that Instagram, checking that thing online. What have all the people who are also sleeping that I know been doing during the night? Oh, nothing, but I'm going to be here anyway. Morning world, solitude. You need to get alone. You need to get into a quiet place so that you can hear God speak. Like, there's, there's power in this if you really think about this. Samuel was in God's temple, but that wasn't enough. He needed to be by himself. And so you need to make sure that you are setting aside time that it is just you and God, not you, God, and the internet. And listen, I know it's super Instagrammable to wake up and take a picture of your coffee and your thing and, and like, ooh, man, quiet time with Jesus. Cut that crap out. You know, no heaven points for that, right? Like, it's not gaining you anything, but maybe some looks he sees from other people. And you know what God says? Well, there's your reward then, because it's not from me, by the way. I'm not trying to be harsh, but it's true. Get into a quiet place, a solitary place, so you can hear from God. The second thing, and be there consistently. And this is so unfun. I know that. I know that. I know that. But you know how you have a great marriage, too? You get to a solitary place, and you do it consistently. It's actually the basis of basically every strong relationship. It's just that it is difficult sometimes because God does feel intangible. And sometimes it does feel like your prayers are hitting the ceiling. But that doesn't negate the fact that God does speak. But only those who hear him are the ones who are truly listening. Solitude, consistency. Find a time. Find a time. Guys, I can, I can struggle with this too. I'll be, I'll be open and honest. This is hard to do in our busy lives. Morning, night, midday, I don't know, but find a time. And that time doesn't need to be sitting and waiting on, on the warm water for the shower to warm up. That isn't, that isn't solitary time. It needs to be something where you are actually sacrificing too consistently. And number three, it is worth it. Number three, this is, this is strong, others. Guess who had to help Samuel realize God was speaking? Eli did. Like, it takes all three of those for God to truly be able to speak to you because it needed an outside godly source who had wisdom and understanding to help confirm what God was speaking to Samuel. And so the problem is, is we might have people in our life, but they're not life speaking people, right? Because let's be honest, it's hard to make friends, isn't it? Like it's hard to make normal friends. Then you put on top of that normal Christian friends, you're like, I might as well just try to find gold in my seat here, right? I mean, I, you know, just being honest, it's hard. And then if you're a couple, let's be honest, it's even harder to find, you know, normal Christian 
couple friends, right? I mean, so it's so hard to find friends. And so what we wind up doing is we don't put ourselves out there. We stay where we're comfortable. And so we never actually grow and have other people speak into our lives or have them come into our lives. And so we're, we're stuck with the same people who are negative, who don't believe like we do. And so when God speaks to us, it's crushed, it's pulled down. It's muted. We need people who can speak positive things in our lives. Solitude, consistently others. Solitude, consistency, others. So get to know the voice of the Lord. Otherwise, you may not be able to handle what comes next. Because God does speak to Samuel. This is so cool. Like, wouldn't this be the thing you would want? Like, man, Samuel struck the God-speaking lottery. God was going to speak to him out loud in the bed. How fantastic. What is he going to say? Probably tell Samuel of all the great things. Samuel, dude, you can't believe the house I'm going to let you build. Oh, Samuel, you're not going to believe how many cool places you're going to go when you follow me. Oh, Samuel, you just, dude, I just can't wait. Let me tell you what, Sam, what God told Samuel. Verse 11, the Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do something in Israel that everyone who hears about it will shudder. Like excited? Verse 12, on that day, I will carry out against Eli everything I said about his family from beginning to to end. I told him that I was going to judge his family forever because of the iniquity he, he knows about. His sons are cursing God and he has not stopped them. 14, therefore I have sworn to Eli's family the iniquity of Eli's family will never be wiped out by either sacrifice or offering. Samuel laid down until morning. Well, you bet he did. Because sometimes when God speaks, it will be uncomfortable. He lay down until morning, and then he opened the doors of the Lord's house. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called to him to ask him. I actually missed a verse there. So 18, so Samuel told him everything, and he did not hide nothing from him. Eli responded, he is the Lord, and let him do what he thinks is good. Important point number two, stay faithful even when it's uncomfortable. See, stay faithful even when it's uncomfortable. Could y'all imagine what was just happening there? Can y'all feel the pressure of that? This was his mentor. This was his father figure. And the first time God speaks to him isn't some grand vision about some awesome ministry opportunities in the future. No, it was actually a statement of judgment for his, you know, father figure mentor guy. Like how heavy that must have been to carry that. And think about that. If you were in those shoes, what would you have wanted to do? Honestly, honestly, not tell him. Ignore it. Say, Eli, dude, I was, I think I was just hearing things last night. Dude, I think it was the fish. It was weird. It was a weird night, you know. I don't know. Never eating that fish again, you know, whatever it was. Or, oh, no, no, God just said things are great. Good job, big guy. I mean, you know, any number of things he could have told him. But no, we stay faithful even when it's uncomfortable. Because see, we have a mentality in our culture, this is what I really felt that we need to hear here, is that we love to say, well, when God has something for me, it's an open door. And when God doesn't have something for me, it's a closed door, right? And so we say, we're like, oh man, God really opened up this door, meaning that the pathway for this is easy. I'm assuming this is the way I'm supposed to take. Or in reverse, I think God's really closed the door there. Sometimes doors aren't closed, they're just difficult, But we would much rather them be closed because there's an open one that's an easier opportunity. The problem is that's not the door that God has called us to. And so I'm not saying that's completely wrong. Sometimes God does open up doors, but we also need to remember that the road, you know, the 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 road of salvation is the straight and narrow, right? It's difficult. It's uncomfortable oftentimes, and we need to get used to that because Jesus Christ, our Savior, showed that. By walking to the cross. Isn't it, aren't you glad that Jesus didn't go like, guys, listen, I've been praying. And we have an open door outside of Jerusalem. There's a lot of ministry we've done. But here, I'm feeling some closed doors. In the shape of a cross. Bearing your sin. So you can have life everlasting. But that's the closed door. See, our faith is birthed out of the difficulty. Our faith is is grounded and rooted in it, not always being easy. But here's the promise that God is always with us, though. See, the problem is we would rather take an easier path where God's not at 
because it's more comfortable there. But that's why so many of us stay stuck here is because when God calls us to this thing, no, not this thing. Like I had a very different picture in mind and it was not this. And so I'm going to be faithful over here on something that makes me feel good. This is not sexy ministry. This is not, you know, make me feel good calling. This is, God, if you call me to this, I will be faithful even when I'm uncomfortable. I'll ruin my, I'll ruin my good shoes for you, Jesus. I don't think my mom was very happy. See, new callings are birthed out of obedience to present callings. New callings are birthed out of obedience to present callings. And so the reason why we feel stuck, the reason why you feel stuck is that every time you circle back around, every time you rededicate and you say you're going to get it right, here's, here's the reality. God will call you back to this again because there's something here that you need to learn. And maybe it's humility for a young guy that thinks he knows everything who obviously did not or doesn't still. Or maybe it's something you need to heal from. Or maybe there's some ministry you need to do there. But whatever this is, God will call you back here until you learn the faithfulness of here. And don't be surprised if he doesn't take you past here until you learn that. New callings are birthed here. 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 And so you talk to people who have done great things, and every time, every time a new calling comes, there's one of these. There's a move. There's an ask. There's a, there's a conversation. There's a decision. There's a lifestyle change that is so uncomfortable, it would have been easier to stay put. But if you are pursuing God, you can't help but move. And so the, the thing that I fear for me and you is that instead of sitting in this tension, a lot of us just quit seeking. Because it's easier for God just to fall silent again. Just fall silent. And you know what? He'll fall silent long enough that you forget about this. But the problem is that one day you will run across something and you'll say, well, God, where are you? And he's like, I've been here the whole time. But I need you to stay faithful even when it's uncomfortable. I need you to stay locked in. I need you to, I need you to when you pray, our God in heaven, hallowed is thy name, your kingdom come and your will be done. I need you to pray that and mean it. Because for those things to happen, it will require you to be uncomfortable. It will require you to step out and maybe get your shoes dirty. And do things that you don't want to do or you've been putting off for a long time. See, when God gives you a calling, expect to move out of your comfort zone. But a lot of things can get in the way. Pride, fear, opinion of others, comfort, you name it. There's so many other voices that will tell you that's foolishness. But those voices are liars. Don't think that the enemy, the Satan, knows how to try to convince you that an open door is a good door too. He knows the same lines. And more importantly, he knows what often works to pull our hearts away from God. See, most of the time, faithfulness, again, isn't sexy. And I'm not trying to say that to be provocative, but I feel like that's the only way to describe what I'm trying to talk about. See, most of the time, faithfulness isn't Instagrammable. And honestly, if it is, it's probably not true faithfulness. I'm just throwing that out there. It's not flashy. It's often hard. It's often costly. And it's also often one of the greatest things you will ever do. Because see, faithful people are changed people. And so we often want to look at the product and just want to bypass the process. Lord, I want to be on the mountaintop, but Jesus, don't make me climb that hill. Just helicopter me to glory. So whenever trials and tribulations come, I can look down upon them and know you've been with me. Well, I'm sorry. God does not offer an elevator service or a helicopter service. It is a get your gear and climb. That's how it works. But this is what happens. So if Samuel had not been faithful in, let's be honest, a seemingly awkward, probably didn't have to happen conversation. Would God have carried out his judgment to Eli even if Samuel had spoken? Uh, yeah, he didn't need a little boy's permission. He'd have spoken through somebody else. 
It's just that Samuel would have been left here. But instead, he was faithful. And this is what the chapter concludes with. This is so good. I love the, the problem solution conclusion of this chapter. Still in chapter 3, 19. As Samuel grew up, the Lord helped him, and this is so good, and made everything, everything Samuel said come true. Like, that's clout. Like, that's a big deal. Well, where did that come from? Was it just because God liked Samuel? No, but Samuel had been faithful and consistent when things weren't comfortable. It says, from the town of Dan in the north to the town of Beersheba in the south, everyone in the country knew that Samuel was truly the Lord's prophet. See, faithfulness will make you look, think, smell, sound different because there's an assignment attached to you. See, we love that kind of talk, but here's the thing. Sometimes that assignment means getting a little uncomfortable, getting a little dirty, getting into the mess, getting involved with people, going outside of your comfort zone. That's what an assignment means. And the Lord often appeared to Samuel at Shiloh and told him what to say. See, being faithful in that uncomfortable thing allowed Samuel to be used by God in great things. So my challenge to all of us is what current calling is holding you back from future ones. Because we can stay at this thing for decades, for lifetimes. Or you can be running from this thing your whole life. And you wonder why sometimes older people can be so bitter and upset at the world. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to judge everybody, but I've just seen it enough to know that people who run from this are never satisfied with the way it turns out in the end. And you know what? A lot of times they have all sorts of stuff, money, clout, all these worldly things. But they miss something so big. And some of the happiest people I've ever seen are the ones that gave up everything to pursue this. To pursue the calling of God. You know what? Sometimes they don't even die in a house that they own. But the impact they leave is larger than anyone could have ever foreseen. So you can live small and comfortable, or you can live big and uncomfortable. So, what is your choice today? Are you hearing from God on a regular basis because? Faithfulness begins with hearing from God. Faithfulness begins with hearing from God. And stay faithful even when it's uncomfortable. You guys will stand with me. We're going to close in prayer. We're not going to close in a song or anything today. We're just going to close in prayer. But I want to encourage you that in your next week, find a quiet place. Find it consistently. Find an accountability partner if you must. Whatever you need to do, find someone who will help you along to confirm what God is speaking in your life. Don't do it alone. But hear from God and push through whatever this thing is, whatever that is. Let's pray. Jesus, you are in charge, and we know that from you comes all wisdom. And so we ask specifically for wisdom to know how to um, hear your voice, to hear when you're speaking, to know what you're calling us to. Give people in this room and listen online that are struggling to take that step into the unknown. Help them to, to, help them to move there. Help them to step into that uncomfortable thing, Lord. Give them the boldness and the passion, Lord. Don't let them be settled with where they are. And Lord, for those of us who are struggling, man, we're in a moment. We're in that place, and it seems so much easier just to walk away. And in a way, it may be, God, but we know that is not your best, and that you have something greater, not only for us, but for those around us. So help them to stay strong and courageous. Lord, strengthen their back and their mind, Lord, that they can stand up to whatever the enemy throws at them, God, that they are your children, and we are conquerors in your name because you have already conquered death, hell, and the grave. And so we have nothing to be afraid of. We can pursue things even though they make us uncomfortable, and we can change our families, this town, and the world. All through your name, we pray today. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.